My name is Ros Roberts. I'm the Secretary of the, the Northern Region. Delighted that the first talk of the year, we've got Steve Lindsay um, talking with us. He's a, a public health entomologist and epi epidemiologist um, who uh, started life with a first degree in applied zoology from Bangor University and then did his PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which you're going to hear a bit more about, I suspect, during the talk. He's best known for his work on developing interventions that protect against malaria. So it's, it's good to know that he's got some credibility on what he's about to talk to us about. Um, he's the director of the GCRF BOVA network, which is about building, our vector -borne disease, building out vector-borne diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and again, we'll be hearing more about that. He's also one of the two lead authors for the um, WHO's Vector Control Strategy for 27 to 2030. It's good to hear that they plan ahead. Uh, and he's obviously uh, got a whole batch of papers behind him, about 250 or so published papers. He's currently a professor at Durham University um, and he holds an honorary chair at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So he's done a lot of work, um, as you can imagine, on um, vector-borne diseases and malaria, and it's that that he's going to talk to us about now. So if you'd like to unmute yourself, Steve, over to you. And thank you for joining me tonight, because what I want to try and do is, on this dark, cold night, put some tropical uh, sun and colour into your lives, uh, reminding us what it is like to be outside this country. Um, I'm going to do well, I'm going to do two things. Um, I think this talk is important from two perspectives. The first is that I'm talking to you about something really fundamental about the world's greatest assassin, which is the malaria mosquito from Africa. So it's telling us about something of the fundamental biology of this creature. And the second thing is it's an illustration how we can get that understanding to develop better interventions. And so this talk is based around those two ideas. So I'm going to assume that you don't know anything about malaria, so I'm going to give you some basic facts and then give you a little bit of evidence for why we think improving houses is protective against malaria. And then thirdly, to go on to talk to you about some of the studies that we've been involved in over the last few, few years and where that's going. So we'll start with the background then. Malaria is a huge problem, but largely in sub-Saharan Africa. It's still a major cause of, of mortality, about 400,000 deaths um, in 2019. But it is not all doom and gloom. From the turn of the millennium to 2015, there was huge reductions in malaria. We dropped by half, which was really unprecedented. It's been one of the great public health achievements of, of uh, of the last literally 100 years. And most of this was thought about by massive deployment of these things, insecticide-treated bed nets, and to a lesser extent, um, indoor residual spraying. Now, the great thing about these nets is they're protective, but they're also very hot to sleep under. And so the major, one of the major reasons for people not using a net is it's too hot. So just hang on to that. Now here comes the biological side of things. This is Anopheles gambi. It's named after the Gambia, one of the smallest countries in Africa, and it's a small, small vector. But the key thing is that most of the malaria transmission is occurring indoors at night. Okay, so it's not a place of sanctuary or your home. It's where you get bitten. And the way that, that this mosquito locates a host is by following carbon dioxide, which the long-range attractant, but also other volatiles produced by humans close to. So I want you to imagine that you're not listening to my talk, you're actually lying down in bed, In you're the cartoon here in orange, and this is you producing large amounts of carbon dioxide and odours, and they leak out of your African house, which has open eaves. So when I'm talking about open eaves, it's this, the gap between the top of the wall and the roof. And mosquitoes fly not more than a meter from the ground, but when they get a whiff of odor, they move up and in. So this is the major route in which mosquitoes get into the house. So understanding the architecture of the house is what we're interested in to see whether we can manipulate that to decrease 
decrease entry. The other thing which I think is, is important is to realize that Africa is changing. So when I started uh, 35 years ago and went to Africa, most of the houses were thatch roof. Now it's changing. So this is from 2000 to 2015, and showing the increase in metal roof houses. So there's a transition going on from thatch to metal roofs. And houses are improving. So this is a sort of good news story for Africa. And with this revolution, can you build on it? Can you build even better? Is the question that I'm asking. So that's the background information that you need to pocket and under understand to fo follow on this talk. But I thought I'd give you a few examples of evidence to show that house screening is protective against malaria. Now, don't collapse here. This is the only sort of busy slide I want to show you. But this uh, is a recent study from 29 different sites in Africa. And we're looking at this little spot here. And it's looking at the risk of, of malaria in people that have bed nets and those that don't in a, in a village. And what it's showing you is if there was no difference, all the dots would be along this line, which is one, but they're all below one, which indicates that they're protective. So overall, bed nets are responsible for 17% reduction in malaria risk in these villages. So everyone's happy with that. So we've looked at the same villages, same communities, and looked at good housing and showed a similar sort of protection with better housing after adjusting for socioeconomic status, which giving us evidence of some weak evidence that housing is protective. Better evidence comes from randomized controlled trials, which and I'll talk about one which I did some years ago in the, in the Gambia, where we had a three-arm study. So we had our control houses where people sleep under a mosquito net, but the eaves are open. And in this one, we put screening along the top of the wall so the mosquitoes couldn't get in down the eaves into the bedroom to feed. And then the final arm of the study, it was full screening. And I can show you what these things look like. So this is the screen netting. We put a ceiling rose in to begin with, and then we put this, this um, nylon mesh over the, the ceiling and then pull it, pull it straight. So that's the intervention with the screen ceiling. And this is the more conventional screen door, which is in the WHO book of what to do about screening. And to cut a long story short, it doesn't really matter what type of screening that you had. You reduce the number of malaria vectors coming in by half, um, and you reduce the amount of anemia by, by half. Now, what's anemia? Anemia is the amount of red blood cells, and the, with malaria, you get explosion of, of the red blood cells because the parasites are growing inside the red blood cells. You also get a reduction in the production of red blood cells from the bone marrow. Why is that important? Well, it's the major cause of mortality of children under two, malaria anemia. So if you, the fact that we reduced anemia in these children by half, or so, so, uh, mild anemia by half, is likely to mean that we would reduce the amount of, uh, of mortality in that age group. So that's a pretty significant find. Okay, now I want to talk to you with the main part of my talk is, is the work that we've done where we've been dissecting out what is it about a house that affects mosquito house entry? How can we adapt this to change the risk of malaria? This is quite a tricky problem. It sounds easy because we want to do two opposing things. We want to keep mosquitoes out, but we want to get as much air into the house as possible to keep it cool so people sleep under a bed net. So that's tricky. So we've gone about this in a sort of, yes, and in a deterministic manner. And here's a house and we cut it up into, well, we, got, we can change the roofs, so let's look at the doors, let's look at the windows. We can either change the height of the house as well. So we started off by looking at the basic types of housing that we get in the, in the, in the Gambia. And before I do that, here's some color that I thought I'd add to, to the talk. This is me in, a, in one of my favorite villages in, in the Gambia. And we're gonna take off and go from the village and go to see where the mosquito breeding sites are. So we're rising up here in our drone and we're going down this uh, 
early in the rainy season, the vegetation is not yet high, and you can even see little flashes of sunlight from pools of water, which could well be aquatic habitats from the mosquito, a little glint down there to the left. But that's not what I'm where, where I'm taking you. I'm taking you to, to show the most prolific breeding sites. What is for mosquitoes nirvana? This is absolutely heaven on earth. This is ideal breeding conditions for Nopheles gambi. They love these open sunlit pools with a little bit of vegetation, the rice growing here, seedlings growing here. And you can see how vast it is. So we're gonna turn around now and go back to our village of Wellingara. And as we get closer, I want you to look, kind of show you something which is really, um, which I want you to focus on. Good. But as we sail in, just look how flat it is. Not a hill in sight. It's not like Northeast England. Now, if you can see here, just on the outskirts of the, of the village, there's one, two, three, four, four, five, six little huts and, or houses that we use in our experiments. And these are the average size single room houses in the Gambia. So they're not diminutive, they are actually the average size. So fine, let's move on. So what we, we did then was look at the basic type of houses that you get in the Gambia and build them here. So here's a thatch roof house. This is a standard traditional house. We always have gaps above the doors and below the doors to let mosquitoes in. No, no windows are on this. This is a typical house. And the eaves are open, which is what the, the arrow points to. So that's number one. Number two, we fill the eaves of the basic thatch house. Number three, we put in screen doors. Now we move to the future. This is representative of, of the common ambient metal roof house. It lasts longer, people like it. So it looks like that inside. And this one was a variation of that theme where we put in screened windows in the gable ends in these eaves. So these are windows, but they're screened. So they don't let mosquitoes in, but the idea is to call the house. So that's what that looks like inside. And what do we do? In each of these houses, we have two men sleeping. And they, they don't get bitten by mosquitoes, they sleep under mosquito nets, but they're generating carbon dioxide and different sort of host odors that attract mosquitoes in. And we capture the mosquitoes with this light trap, and then we measure temperature and humidity inside the houses. They look at the indoor climate. And this is the row of houses, all brilliantly made up, and we've got an outside med station as well. And we run this, but every week we change the position of the house typology. And I thought you'd like to see this entertainment. So this is what happened. So they're saying slowly, slowly. Come, come, come. Someone who's too small wants to stick. And so on. So every week we move the, the, the house around so that we have a balanced design at the end of it. So we can then adjust for geographic position and look at what we're really interested in what's going on with the house type. Now, these are the results here. These little cartoons represent the thatch roof houses. So with open eaves, lots of mosquitoes. We know that. We also know that if you close the eaves, which is this one here, you drop the numbers coming in dramatically. So no surprises there, but it's nice confirmation. And it's the same if you have a screen door. What was really strange was with a metal roof house, we got similar number of mosquitoes to a thatch roof house with open eaves. This shouldn't be so, because we know that the mosquitoes come in through the open eaves. It should be exactly the same as this one. Both. This is a metal roof house, this one, this is a thatch roof house with closed eaves. So why is this one so much more, um, has so many more mosquitoes? Well, the answer to that is in what's going on inside the, the house. These houses are hot. This is a metal roof house, very hot during the day. And even if we have a ventilated house, they get hot during the afternoon as well but will drop the temperature very, very much at night to be 
as cool as the thatch roof house. This is the nighttime temperature. Um, and in, indeed, the me ventilated metal roof house can actually be cooler than a thatch roof house. So little di divergence here. Just look at these temperatures here that they're experienced. So well over 30 degrees centigrade. And Lindsay's law, or rule rather, says anything over 30 degrees centigrade is alarm bells ringing. Because the body is trying to say, oh no, I don't like this, this is really too hot, and I'm going to keep the body as cool as possible by chucking out as much sweat as I can. And these are old results, but really fantastic results, looking at human beings sweating from various parts of their anatomy in relation to ambient temperature. And the line I draw in here exemplifies Lindsay's law, where if you get over 30 degrees centigrade, you start sweating profusely. So these very hot temperatures are probably producing lots of carbon dioxide, lots of volatiles that show the mosquitoes are there. And we did the experiment where we're actually measuring carbon dioxide in these two types of houses with closed ease, the thatch and the metal. And what we can see here is that there's more carbon dioxide generated, a lot of variation admittedly, but more carbon dioxide generally um, produced in those metal roof houses because they're hotter. So that's fine. So that's the, the basic study, study times. But we then started to look at every feature of the house. And we thought, well, let's change the windows. We're thinking, why should we do it? But before we do that, let me just get across one of the really important points is to think about African houses because they're simply too hot. They're too hot because they're made of materials like mud or concrete, which have a high thermal mass. And those materials heat up during the day and radiate temperature at night. So if you look at this, this is a thermal photograph of a Gambian house at night. And you can see that the white area indicates how radiating heat, the walls are hot because they've been heated up by the sun during the day. And it's now radiating heat long into the night. So these houses are very hot in marked contrast to what you find in traditional houses in Southeast Asia, which are made from materials with low thermal mass, so and well ventilated. So in this picture, you see the, 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 uh, the window and, and the bamboo here that slots in to allow breeze to go through the house, which you wouldn't get in the Gambia house. So the important thing to understand is that cross ventilation is really important. So if you're putting in a, a window to cool it, you need two, one on opposite sides of the, the building. So if this is your bedroom or if this is your office and you don't want to, to have COVID viruses circulating in the atmosphere, then this is what you need to do. Open the, the door and open the window despite it being cold. Cross ventilation is really important. So we wanted to know whether this actually happens in an African house. So we are using these houses I showed you earlier. And what we've got here is, is a design where we've got a reference house, which is these windows are essentially closed. They're, they're filled with metal plates with little gaps around them. But we put in one window, two windows, three windows, in the tiny windows, and we've the only way that mosquitoes can get into the house is, as usual, through the gaps above and below the door. So we run this experiment for 20 nights and we change the position of the, of the houses each week. And just to show that I'm not conning you on, on this, this is the interiors of a typical Gambian house in, in the Wellingara village where we work and showing the gaps above and below the door, which is pretty common. This is what our experimental houses look like. That's the, the, uh, the reference house. And what we found was no difference to the indoor temperature at all, which, which is, I, I was surprised. But I was even more surprised at what was happening to mosquito numbers. Here's the reference house. Here's one window, no difference. We've got an asterisk here to, to show a significant difference from the reference house. And so with two, with uh, equivalent to three windows as well. So we went back and did the study a bit better using the average size of windows in the local village. And again, we've got a reference house, 
one window, two windows, three windows, and they're getting in through the gaps around the door. Again, we've got people sleeping them overnight to attract the mosquitoes. This is what this looks like. This is the reference house, little gap above and below the window. And this is one of our um, screened windows. This time we did show that with three screen windows, we reduced the temperature indoors at night. So people more likely to use a net. But really interestingly, what we found was that it also reduced the number of mosquitoes coming in. So quite dramatically. And slightly naughty, but I put the results of the small window experiments together with the big window experiments to produce this graphic. What this shows is as you increase the area of screen window, the reduction in mosquitoes increases the reduction re relative to the reference one. So we're getting control here of almost a 90% reduction in mosquitoes simply using screen windows. There's no in insecticide on these windows. It's just ventilation is reducing the mosquitoes. So this had us scratching our heads. So we went back the following year and we did some experiments using two houses. And for the ornithologists in the audience, this is a plantate, plantate eater that photobombed this photograph. But anyhow, so these are the houses that we did these experiments with. So two identical houses um, with the roofs off. We had two houses in an experiment, one with um, screened windows only and one with screened windows and doors. So we were wondering, does the ventilation, ventilation reduce the indoor concentration of carbon dioxide? You know, that's what attracts mosquitoes in. If so, we should have lower concentrations in this house than in A. So B should be lower than A. And when we look at the temperature, we show that these houses in B, the temperature, it was cooler than in house A. So putting in screen doors and windows isn't what keeps it cool at night, which is good. And more importantly, from our perspective is we made a big reduction in carbon dioxide by putting in the screen door relative to the outdoor um, amount of, uh, of CO2, which is about 425, 4, 400 parts per million. So that could explain what's going on. But we also wanted to see the shape of this. And what we did here was use computational fluid dynamic modeling, which is real state-of-the-art physics, which is where we're building models of as though carbon dioxide is a liquid and it's moving out of the house as a liquid. And the rate of which, of which the carbon dioxide move is determined by the indoor climate and by what the materials are made of in the house. And we've been doing work over a number of years to, to, um, to show that this, that our computerized models actually is based on reality to model the distribution of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So what we've got in our simulation here is two people under a bed net and door and a window and what you're going to see next is sections taken through the house through the windows and through the door and this is what it looks like so this is a scenario with no wind in a house that's got absolutely no screening but leaky doors and you get this jet of carbon dioxide being squirted out of the house attracting those mosquitoes in from a distance but if you put in screen windows to concentrate or screen doors and windows, the concentration of CO2 drops dramatically and actually wafts up. So if you look at the index here, you can see that much less carbon dioxide is being produced. And if you look at this graphic, you can see that our, our person is actually breathing out intensely rich carbon dioxide. But in these poorly ventilated houses, carbon dioxide just accumulates. So that's no wind, but it's telling us that the carbon, that the, the house is, is determining the shape of the odor plume coming out and screening reduces that odor plume. It's also true if you have a house where you inject wind in, into, the, to the, um, into the model. So we're using the average strength of the wind that we recorded in our experimental setup. 
And again, you, you can see that in a house that's got um, screen doors and windows, it's really very low levels of carbon dioxide, just above the, le the background levels. So that explains why you get fewer mosquitoes coming in, because they're struggling to find entrance to the house, we, we think. So that's illustrating how important carbon dioxide is. Um, so that's the windows, and we did, we looked at height as well, and I thought I'd, I'd show you this because it's a bit of fun. This is our specially designed houses, which could be moved up and down. We have four of them, and uh, on any one night, as shown here, we have one which is a one meter, one three meters, one on the ground, and one at two meters. And what you can see from this figure is that as you increase the height of the hut, the number of mosquitoes goes down. So again, that's no insecticide, that's simply elevating the houses. As many houses are in, in Southeast Asia and actually in parts of Africa as well, although it's unusual. One of the other things which we thought was interesting was the importance of metal roofs and what that does to mosquitoes, because it's damn hot in, in, inside metal roof houses. Now, okay, okay, I want you to imagine, we're gonna play another thought game, but I want you to imagine that tonight, you are sleeping in this African house under the mosquito net, and you lie close to the, the bed net and you get bitten by a mosquito. So this, shows you the mosquito's abdomen full of beautiful uh, red crimson blood of yours. And she's using this to turn the blood mill into eggs. Now, tomorrow night, on Friday night, she'll have turned half the, um, or digested half the blood mill, and she'll start producing immature eggs, but she's still inside the house. She's not going anywhere. And on the second night, so it's Saturday night, she's got a full package of, of eggs and she'll fly out of the house and go and lay. And the important point is though, she's in the house for two days, so she can't ex escape the climate of the house. So we looked at the survival of mosquitoes in houses which were thatch versus um, metal. And this is one of our cages where we're putting in 30 blood-fed laboratory-reared mosquitoes into this cage which is actually a compass uh, bag that you get at, at, uh, at B&Q, but never mind, it's a cage, it's got netting at the top and bottom. And in year one, we compared survival in thatch houses versus our ventilated houses, and these have got cooler windows here. And in the second year, we did thatch versus metal roof houses. What did we find? We found increased mortality as you'd expect in the metal roof houses because they're hotter always hotter in the afternoon than the thatch roof houses and over two days that makes a big difference and again with the metal roof house versus the thatch so that makes a huge difference and if you want to know one single factor that changes the risk of malaria it's reducing the survival of the mosquitoes so if you reduce the survival of a population of mosquitoes en masse, you can drastically reduce malaria transmission. Why? Because it's the old girls that are transmitting the disease because it takes 10 days for the malaria parasite to grow and become infective in a mosquito. So it, we're really in the game of killing old mosquitoes. And what we're suggesting is metal roof houses on a large scale in very hot parts of Africa are killing substantial numbers of mosquitoes. Okay, just take a bit of a pause there in a slightly different direction. We've also been interested in developing new products because what people are using in the in the uh, in the, the villages are not up to scratch. They're low quality materials. So for those of you that have worked in Francophone Africa, you'll be familiar with this type of door. It's a it's, it's, um, it's louvered and it allows air to come in, but also mosquitoes. We built, built a version of this where we screen put screening behind it, but it's not very robust. And the big problem with materials is when you've got two different materials 
different types of materials together, they tend to come apart. So we worked on producing this design of house, which is made entirely of, of, of metal. But if you look close to, if you knelt on the ground below the door, you would see that underneath the louvers are lots of tiny holes. So these holes keep mosquitoes out, but allow ventilation to occur. The other important thing is these doors are self-closing. So you open the door, you let go, it shuts at night. And we had tested four different variations of this. And this is the, the standard village door by comparison. Interesting thing here is all doors are the same size. Why? Because this is a sheet of corrugate that comes in a standard sort of package. This is great because it means you can mass produce the same size of door uh, to fit this, this gap. And that's what I'm gonna show you next. So this is us putting in some doors in a local village. So this is our base camp, which is uh, down by the river Gambia. This is me actually doing some proper work. And we're taking the doors into one of the village houses. Gently removing the old door, gently expanding the, the door frame. Notice the health and safety material. We did actually get these guys um, steel toe, toe cap shoes, and on day two, they disappeared. Any more than that. But grabbing the doors, we need to make sure that they fit well. And this gentleman here is Jakob Nussen, who's done the design. Here's another of our prototype, and that's the final. There you go. So that's our doors. Does it do any good? Well, yes. It, having a proper screen door, as shown here, reduces the number of mosquitoes coming in by quite a bit. One of the issues, that, though, is, is human behaviour, of course. And people like to keep the doors open. Why? Because the house is hot. So they keep the doors open in the evening to cool the house. So there are issues here with some of these interventions. We've also been interested in completely new designs and here's some of the work that we've been doing in northern tanzania where we're making buildings of lightweight material this is bamboo we actually flew out a thai bamboo house builder to tanzania to make this single story that's at night off that's a, the proud owner of this house it's lovely inside that's a two-story building this one's made of not of bamboo, but of wood, but wood's increasingly expensive in, in, in Africa because it's a scarce resource. That's at night to show you how light and airy it is inside. That's the second story. And this is a building which is made of shade cloth. And you'll say, well, well what's shade cloth? Next time you go past some scaffolding, look at what's wrapped around the scaffolding. That's probably shade cloth. So there's a house with shade cloth, which is a two-story building. Now, what we found was that in this small study, this pilot study, if you had a house with shade cloth and a screen, it reduces the number of mosquitoes coming in by 77%. And if you have it elevated, by 96%. So big reductions, and again, no insecticide to be seen. And I'm going to finish off by just telling you a little bit about the study that we're engaged with at the moment in Matwara in the south of Tanzania on the coast. And we've been building more of these houses, but here we're not just interested in malaria, we're interested in producing and building healthy homes. And I'll explain that in a little, little while. But these are the, the houses that we're building. So this is the, the drawing of our house. We've got an upstairs bedroom and a downstairs kitchen and, and storeroom with water being stored outside and a very nice toilet. So if you're inside the top, top floor, it's well screened 
it's well aerated, so ventilated, so you have low CO2, it screens, you have fewer mosquitoes, and it's elevated, so it should get far more mosquitoes, fewer mosquitoes than the house on the ground. We're also concerned about respiratory infections in children. One of the biggest um, problems that children have is with wood smoke. So we've designed a, uh, uh, a fire stove with a good chimney to try and reduce that inside the kitchen. The kitchen's well screened as well and ventilated. And then to reduce diarrheal diseases, we have the whole house is, has concrete floor so it can be easily cleaned. We have clean water which we collect off the ceiling. There's a clever device here that on heavy rains, the first rain flushes down here and cleans the pipes. But when you get an accumulation of rain, it then accumulates in this um, in the water storage container. And here's our nice toilet, which is not exposed and much better than local toilets. Um, so we're building 110 of these houses. Um, we've built so far. We've built the structures, and we should finish all the houses by um, by March. So not far to go. And this is where we were going into the villages and having lotteries for people to pick these star homes. And this is the first proud owner of, the, of our first home. So here's his house, and he's going to get one of these very beautiful star homes. And this is the 110 happy recipients of their new homes. OK, so to finish off, um, I want to get across the message that house design is really important for reducing mosquito house entry. And there's plenty of scope for new innovations. We've only really just begun to scratch the surface of this, but there's new possibilities as new houses are being built in Africa that we increase the amount of houses that are screened and we help them help people screen their houses properly. And it's potentially important for malaria control. So in a nutshell, the take home message is the simplest thing one can do is put two large ventilated, uh, two large screened house, uh, windows into a house to increase ventilation and sleep under an insecticide treated bed net to maximize the protection. Uh, I'd like to thank the GCRF that funded the BOVA network, which is building out vector borne diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, to my students, of course, I. I did nothing, nothing here. It was all done by um, our student. This is a Brian Ajata in uh, and a very important staff at uh, Wallikunda Field Station in the Gambia. And this is a Brian outside graduating with a master's of research outside Durham University. This is Maho, who's presently trapped in Ecuador, who's carrying on with the, the uh, fine tradition of, of research uh, in the Gambia. And most importantly, to thank the people of Wellingara for, for helping us over the years. And a lot of thanks to lots of people, and particularly uh, my friend and colleague, Jakob Knudsen, who's the head of architecture in Copenhagen University that has designed these beautiful buildings I've been showing you. So thanks for listening.